Before we begin, I need to disclose the following. Alexander Macris, apologies if I mispronounced that, the lead developer for this game, is someone who I've had a few words with from time to time. While I will note that I told him in advance I was going to do this review, I will be doing my utmost to ensure that my relationship with him does not interfere with my evaluation. With that said, on to the review proper. If you can make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to the night, and if they can stop you, Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. If you saw my last musing, you'll know that I have a complicated relationship with OSR and old school play. While I've made some measure of peace in the last few years, there are a few things that still bug me. But, again, that's more on the community than on the developers. However, I did make the mistake of comparing most retro clones to AD&D. In fact, there's more variety in their source material than I initially viewed it. A trend I've noticed, however, in the last few years is that the better of the old-school games are relying less and less on slavishly adapting TSR-era D&D and more on using the framework to build around a specific style of play. In other words, using TSR-era D&D as a framework rather than the end goal. I've seen some people call these Neo-clones, but I'm not entirely fond of that term. Adventurer Conqueror King system, hereafter referred to as Axe, is one such instance. In this case, it's based around taking the oft-discussed but underused endgame and integrating it into its core design through tiers of play. This is where its namesake comes in. As players increase in levels, they also increase in influence and power beyond how hard they can swing a sword or cast a spell. How does it hold up? Let's find out. The layout is straightforward with a clear font in the typical two-column format. Artwork is a bit sparse, but the book is fairly well organized. Those familiar with Labyrinth Lord or Osric will find a lot of familiar territory in the book. Overall, though, pretty solid. If you've played Old School D&D or New School D20, most of the steps and character creation should be familiar to you. However, Axe has its own quirks in this regard. For the purposes of example, we'll be making a fighter-type character in this section named Felix, because I love alliteration. The first step is to generate his ability scores, which is determined by a more stringent 3d6 six times. This generates the following assigned abilities and modifiers in our case. Strength 18 plus 3, Intelligence 14 plus 1, Wisdom 15 plus 1, Constitution 16 plus 2, and Charisma 12, 0. Second step is to choose a class. In keeping with our theme, we'll be going with Fighter. As a level 1 fighter, this grants us the title of Man at Arms. As a fighter, Felix has a d8 hit die rolling it and adding the constitution modifier. The roll resulted in a 7, so we start with 9 hit points. Furthermore, being a fighter determines the character's saving throws, his non-armor defenses, as well as initiative. So here we have Petrification and Paralysis 15+, Poison and Death 14+, Blast and Breath 16+, Staffs and Wands 16+, and Spells 17+, for saving throws. His initiative modifier is the same as his dexterity modifier, and thus is plus 1. His attack throw is plus 10, but that won't be on the sheet until equipment is factored in. Every character starting at level 1 gains two proficiencies, small quirks of the character. One of these is from the general list, and another one is from a class-specific list. In our case, we'll choose the combat reflexes and manual of arms proficiencies. However, having an intelligence modifier allows us to add an additional proficiency, so we'll add the fighting style with two-handed weapon. Finally, we determine Felix's starting coin to spend on equipment. Starting gold is determined by a 3d6 roll and multiplying the results by 10. This grants us 120 GP. For starting equipment, we'll go with a two-handed sword, plate armor, a short bow, 20 arrows, a tunic, boots, a backpack, and two weeks of rations, leaving us with 23 GP left as pocket money. Like most old school games, character creation is fairly straightforward. There are a few minor changes when it comes to ability score calculation and in a few other parts, but overall it is very, very familiar. That's a word you'll hear a lot in this. The real dividing line I can see for some is the proficiency system. While I personally liked it and felt it helps classes not be cookie cutter, I can understand if it's a deal breaker. I've seen some compared to the proficiencies in AD&D 2nd, or in some cases the feat system in 3rd, that could potentially game the mechanics. I do not hold to that personally, but it's going to depend on how much of a purist for old school that you are. My only nitpick with them is that there's only one example archetype per class in the core book. I don't think having just one archetype for each class shows the potential that the proficiency system can have, but I'll err on the side of their inclusion being a smart move regardless. 
Much like character creation, the core mechanic is straightforward. When rolling a d20, you want to exceed a minimum roll based on your class's throws to succeed or fail at attacks, actions, or saves. However, while a natural 20 on an attack roll is a success, it does not grant additional damage. That's only available through the weapon focus proficiency. Interestingly, reaching negative HP results in a roll on a wound table that can result in instant death or permanent wounds, with a similar set of mishaps for magical revival. I like this setup. It's a way to be less unforgiving and discourage save or die situations. I will say that this game technically uses Thaco, but it's presented in a much more concise manner than in other games. It is a bit confusing at first, but nothing impossible to deal with. Magic is another point of diversion from its old school roots. While spells per day are still a thing, the game does away with memorization or preparation to favor spontaneous casting. Because the game caps off at level 14, the highest tiers of arcane and divine magic are instead treated as rituals, since by that level it's assumed that you'll have a bevy of followers and lower tier servants to assist you with group casting. I think this fits in with the overall theme. In these reviews, I tend to stick to the core book. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Adventurer's Companion supplement here. For the most part, the book is an expansion on ideas laid out in the core rulebook, providing new classes and templates that, in my opinion, better showcase what the game is capable of. However, the biggest addition is its system for creating your own classes. Given the nature of this game, this also factors in late game followers as well. It is still, however, a everything we couldn't fit in the main book kind of expansion, so bear that in mind. As I said in the beginning, the end game with old school D&D is something that's often talked about but rarely utilized. Axe, in my opinion, takes that concept and weaves it into the core of the game's approach very, very well. I'll also admit to liking how it handles proficiencies, something that was underdeveloped when initially introduced. I've seen some claim, again, that it's veering too close to feats, but honestly, I don't see it. However, if you're a veteran of other OSR-style games like Osric or Labyrinth Lord again, I won't deny that this game is a much harder sell since this can appear as more AD&D or just another retro clone. I don't think that it is a retro clone again, but that's how it can appear to some. While Axe is very much an old school game, I'd consider it more of a second generation OSR than a retro clone. All in all, I'd give Axe a stamp of recommended. But with the caveat that you get the core book and the player's companion if possible. The core book alone is a damn fine game but I think the player's companion takes the additional step in showing what the game is really capable of. On the other hand, if the endgame idea of followers and strongholds doesn't interest you or isn't suited to the style of play that you want to do, then Axe probably isn't going to be your cup of tea. I may not be the biggest fan of OSR, but I know a quality game when I see it. Hey there folks, thanks for watching through it. If you liked what you saw, make sure to leave a like and shoot me a few lines about what you'd like to see next. I'm always looking for feedback. I do have an Imager album that's going to contain future review ideas. That's expanding every moment. And if you feel like supporting your favorite monk, check out my Patreon. That's going to be linked in the low bar. But until then, my name is Miltra. I'm your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.